Сан. Most presentations on avalanche dynamics start with an equation like this, but we won't use complicated equations in this video because we're only trying to introduce some of the key concepts about the dynamics and impact of snow avalanches. In this video, Christian Yedeke and I are going to use videos of avalanches in motion and a few graphs to explain these concepts. Okay, there is one simple equation which helps us compare the impact from avalanches with different characteristics. Looking at this big avalanche from northern Norway, you probably wonder if the deflecting wall will withstand the avalanche. This video outlines the key factors that affect the impact and destructive potential of avalanches. Here are two columns of the avalanche size scale used in Europe. The damage potential caused by the five size classes range widely, from size 1 avalanches that would not bury a person but could push a person off a climbing route, to size 5 avalanches that can gouge the landscape and cause disastrous damage such as destroying a village or a reinforced concrete structure. Slab avalanches start out as gliding blocks, which then break up into smaller and smaller lumps. At about 10 meters per second, a powder cloud of suspended particles starts to form above a dense flowing core, but only if the avalanche is dry. Wet avalanches do not form a powder cloud. Also, they tend to follow gullies more than fast, dry avalanches. This large, wet avalanche is relatively slow. The flow consists of rounded lumps that are larger than are typical of granular flow. Although slow, this massive avalanche could destroy a large truck, so it is a size 4. When I was a kid, traveling in the car, I would hold my hand out the window to feel the pressure from the wind. I noticed that the pressure at 100 km per hour was much higher, more than double the pressure than at 50 km per hour. That is because for liquids, gases, and snow avalanches, the impact pressure is proportional to the flow density times the speed squared. So when the speed doubled, the pressure on my hand would be about four times higher. For impact pressure, we also need an estimate of flow density. For a large dry avalanche, the density of the flowing snow decreases with height as shown by the green line from up to 300 kilograms per cubic meter in the dense core to a few kilograms per cubic meter high in the powder layer. Since air has a density around 1.3 kilograms per cubic meter, the flow high in the powder layer is only a few times denser than air. Sometimes the impact pressure is calculated for these two layers, the dense flowing layer and the powder or suspension layer. Alternatively, we can estimate the change in impact pressure with height if we represent the avalanche by three layers. The dense flowing layer, the middle saltation layer, and the powder layer. When calculating the impact pressure for these three layers, we often assume density values of 3, 30, and 300 kilograms per cubic meter for each of these layers. Consequently, the dry dense flow can have a density about 100 times greater than the powder layer. So which layer has the highest impact pressure? The speeds of each of these layers along the slope are similar, so the impact pressure from the dense core can be about 100 times higher than the impact pressure from the powder layer. However, the greater height of the powder layer means its impact force on tall objects can be substantial. Impact pressure is the impact force divided by the area that is impacted. So, when considering the destructive potential, we also need to consider the force on the area that is impacted. In unconfined terrain, the dense flow is often only 1 or 2 meters high, whereas the powder layer can be 30 or more meters high. To better understand the impact force and destructive potential, let's assume the powder layer of this avalanche has a flow density of about 3 kilograms per cubic meter, and the dense layer has a flow density about 200 kilograms per cubic meter, which is about 60 times higher. Since the speeds of these layers along the slope are similar, the impact pressure from the powder layer 
is less than 2% of the impact pressure from the dense layer. However, the impact force from the powder layer on an object over 30 meters high could be a third of the impact force from a 1.5 meter thick dense layer. I'll get back to avalanche impact on tall objects in a few minutes. For zoning residential areas, the average impact pressure on a hypothetical wall that extends across the slope is used. It is the flow density times speed squared. The average impact pressure is also used for comparing impact pressure from different layers and for comparing different sizes of avalanches. For speeds up to 60 meters per second, this graph shows the average impact pressure for the dense flowing layer and the middle saltation layer. The impact pressure for the powder cloud is in green and hiding at the bottom of the graph. The Canadian size scale gives these typical values of impact pressure for size 3, 4, and 5 avalanches. These impact pressures are most likely to be caused by the dry dense flow. To see the impact pressure for size 2 avalanches, I'll zoom in to the lower left part of the graph. We see that the impact pressure typical of size 2 avalanches can be achieved by a speed of about 6 meters per second in the dry dense flow. And at a speed of about 10 meters per second, perhaps as low as 6 meters per second, the dry dense flow can destroy wood frame houses. So at speeds well below 60 meters per second, the dry dense flow can destroy wood frame houses. To see damage, such as breaking doors and windows, we have to zoom in to the lower left corner even more. Now we see the, the dense flow can break doors at about 4 meters per second and break windows at about 2 meters per second. Although you can't see it on this graph, the powder cloud has to reach a speed of about 20 meters per second to break windows. Here are three clips of small wet avalanches in motion. Each avalanche quickly accelerates and increases in mass by entraining the full thickness of the snowpack. The avalanches could bury and kill a person, so they are size twos. The flow density is likely between 400 and 500 kilograms per cubic meter. From my estimates of flow density and speed, the average impact pressure is about 10 kilopascals, which is typical of size two avalanches. In this video of a large dry avalanche, we see the height of the deflecting wall has been designed only for the dense flow, which has the highest impact pressure. The powder layer flows over the deflecting wall and hits the buildings with less impact pressure than the deflected dense flow. However, because of the height of the buildings, the impact force from the powder layer can be substantial. The flow density and hence the impact pressure decrease with height as shown by this red line. Note that well above the dense flow, the impact pressure was sufficient to break all the branches on the uphill side of this tree. Also, it appears a little more force from the powder layer high on the tree would have broken more of the roots and could have toppled the tree. When trees located past the deposit from the dense flow are damaged, we can be sure the powder layer did the damage. When analyzing the impact on tall objects, the run-up of the layers is considered. This includes walls like this one, which protects a highway. The run-up and impact calculations can be done for two, or, as shown here, for three layers. The dense flow, the fluidized or saltation layer, and the powder layer. While a wall can be designed to stop the run-up from the dense flow and fluidized layers, the powder layer is too tall to be stopped. The powder layer of a large dry avalanche typically flows past the deposit from the dense flow. Let's assume the toe of the dense deposit from the avalanche is around here. Note that years ago, the forest has been destroyed up to this trim line. Of course, we can't be sure that the dense flow of this previous avalanche that made the trim line didn't contribute to the forest damage. Eventually, when the speed of a powder avalanche decreases, the impact pressure, which depends on the speed squared, decreases to the point where it can run through a forest without breaking many branches. Let's look at how the speed varies along a tall avalanche path. 
In this video of a large dry avalanche, we see rapid acceleration in the start zone. Now we see formation of the powder layer that hides the dense flow. In the track, the speed is relatively constant. On the gentle slope near the buildings, the avalanche decelerates. Here is the profile of a large avalanche path. It extends almost two and a half kilometers horizontally and drops about 1,000 meters. As is common for many tall paths, the slope angle decreases progressively. The front speed of this avalanche was measured with radar. Initially, the pull of gravity along the slope was greater than the resistance, so the avalanche accelerated rapidly. In the track, the pull of gravity along the slope was similar to the resistance, so the speed varied less. Doppler radar has shown that large dry avalanches start to decelerate where the slope angle decreases to about 25 degrees. In the runout zone, where the resistance was greater than the pull of gravity along the slope, the avalanche decelerated rapidly. Like most large dry avalanches, the speed peaked in the track. However, the impact force and destructive potential also depend on the accumulated mass and flow height, which tend to increase in the track. Consequently, when classifying the size of an avalanche based on its destructive potential, for example, could it destroy a car, we should be considering wherever the destructive potential is greatest. For large avalanches, this often occurs in the lower part of the track or upper part of the runout zone. Let's talk about the factors that influence the maximum speed of an avalanche. Each of these blue dots represents the maximum speed of an avalanche at Rogers Pass in Canada for the height that the avalanche descended, which is called the fall height. For example, this avalanche descended about 400 meters and reached a maximum speed of about 17 meters per second. The graph shows an increase in maximum speed for avalanches that descended a greater fall height. The scatter of the blue dots indicate that there are other factors that influence the maximum speed. These factors include the mass of snow that released and the slope angle in the start zone and track. Although the fastest speed in this set of avalanches is about 65 meters per second, avalanches can go faster, especially in taller paths or in paths where the start zone and track are particularly steep. A few minutes ago, I used the average impact pressure to compare the impact from the dense and powder layers. However, the average impact pressure is not used for designing structures. This is partly because the speed along the slope is not constant, even on a constant slope. Look at the surges in speed at the front of this dry avalanche. When engineers are designing structures to withstand the peak impact from avalanches, they consider the surges shown here, as well as lumps in the flow, and sometimes solid objects in the flow, like broken trees. The avalanche impact on a structure also depends in part on the orientation of walls. The walls of this Swiss church are oriented to reduce the impact pressure. For a wall at 45 degrees to the flow direction, which is more angle than is shown in this photo, the impact pressure is about half what it would be on a wall perpendicular to the flow. Not surprisingly, there would also be friction on the walls from an avalanche sliding against them. Using a video of an avalanche, the front speed can be estimated from the time it takes for the front to travel between features such as rocks or trees. In this video clip, this rock and the bottom trees are about 80 to 100 meters apart. The front travels between these features in about three seconds. So the front speed at this stage is about 25 to 33 meters per second. If the density of the dense flow was 200 kilograms per cubic meter, the average impact pressure would be about 120 to 200 kilopascals, which is many times the impact pressure required to destroy a wood frame house. When designing a structure such as a deflecting wall, avalanche engineers 
don't have videos of extreme avalanches, so they use the speed from Dynamics models. I hope someone, perhaps my colleagues, will make a follow-up video about modeling avalanche dynamics. Looking at this diagram again, we see that the snow from the stationary snowpack is being entrained into the avalanche. This is the most common way, but not the only way in which an avalanche increases in mass. While the mass of a small avalanche may not change much as it moves down slope, the mass of a large avalanche can increase up to five times, sometimes more. As I just mentioned, the mass of a large avalanche tends to increase as it flows down the slope. However, some avalanches can leave some of their mass behind above the main deposit. This sometimes occurs on a bench or less steep part of the slope as shown in this photo. There are several types of resistance that tend to slow down avalanches. The most obvious one is the sliding friction at the base of the dense layer, which is also called Coulomb friction. If the avalanche is in training stationary snow at its front, this is another type of resistance. There is granular flow within the dense layer in which particles collide and move past one another. The part of the granular flow that is easiest to visualize is the shear in which the top moves downslope faster than the bottom. For mixed motion dry avalanches, there is turbulence in the upper less dense layers. Also, there is air drag at the front of the avalanche. So resistance is complicated and it's different for the various layers in an avalanche and the various types of flow. At the right side of your screen, we see a wet avalanche flowing like a slow freight train along the road. This is called plug flow. Note the pressure from far behind the front. Because there is little entrainment, turbulence, or deformation within the plug, the primary resistance is the sliding friction at the base of the plug. Since the sliding friction is less on the road than beside the road, avalanches like this tend to flow farther along the road. Looking at the gully, the slope is steeper and the steepness overcomes the roughness, so the avalanche moves faster down the gully than on the road. Although the same physical processes apply to small and large avalanches, there are a few differences in the resulting characteristics due primarily to the smaller mass of the released snow. Small avalanches don't entrain much snow. They may stop in the start zone or track. Some stop on a slope steeper than 20 degrees. Because the speed of small avalanches is usually lower, the impact pressure is usually substantially less. We started with a question about the avalanche impact on the deflecting wall. In this video, we've seen that the average impact pressure depends on the flow density and the speed squared. For multi-layer dry avalanches, the hidden dense layer has the highest impact pressure, but the much taller powder layer can cause substantial impact force and destructive potential. We saw these different types of flow for wet avalanches. Although the speed of wet avalanches is typically lower, the flow density of wet avalanches often exceeds that of the bottom dense layer of dry avalanches. So wet avalanches can also be very destructive. They can reach size 5. Thanks for watching and tolerating all the graphs. Feel free to like or share this video, or subscribe or add comments below. Christian Yadiki and I are specifically interested if our approach, using videos and graphs but almost no math, was helpful or not. Thanks to Chris Wilbur and Peter Gower for their constructive comments on early versions of this video.